In central Washington, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as permittees, have partnered with financial assistance from the Bureau of Reclamation to use virtual fencing technology to improve grazing management. I recently sat down with Chad Edison and Rich Finger with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to talk about efforts and what it means for the environment, the state, as well as area ranchers. Um, the, the current system that we're using uh, is basically a set of base stations. So you have like GPS towers that um, provide signals and then the cows uh, are fitted with a collar. So you've got the collars and the base station are the two primary components. Uh, you then use like a, an online uh, application that allows you to set up a fence system that the base station relays to the callers. So the cows are getting signals, the callers are getting signals from the base station. So you're able to, you know, essentially use a quote unquote virtual fence to either augment a hard fence or create a fence in a location that you don't have a physical fence. So the way we're using that is to um, keep cows in certain portions of a grazing lease or push cows in certain uh, sections of a grazing lease that don't have a cross fence. And one of the things I found very interesting, and, and maybe it's just because I'm not very technologically savvy, these towers aren't especially big, but boy, they've got a really big signal, don't they? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is being strategic with the topography and the placement of the stations. You know, we worked with the vendor to find the, the best coverage for the couple of leases that we're using them on. We we're pretty lucky because the the two producers that that seemed most interested in it and sort of the scenario that fit using these this new technology are, are side by side. So um, we we have one on one pasture, one on the other pasture, and that creates coverage on both pastures in a pretty extended area. So um, here, you know, we get really good coverage. We're fairly flat. Um, a little bit of topography gets that signal way out there. Uh, in the mountains, guys are having to use more stations. Uh, just to make up for the hills. And then they're having like larger dead areas where the callers are not communicating directly with the station. Um, we don't have that as much. We have pretty much direct communication. So yeah, we're, we're pretty lucky in those. Yeah, the stations do provide pretty darn good coverage. And it seems to me that this is a great benefit from the producer's perspective. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to the technology that could be beneficial to the producer. I mean, in our case, uh, you know, the couple producers know where their cows are. Um, if we have cows get out or if cows are on the wrong part of the lease, uh, we, we know they're there. We can, we can go look at them on a screen and, and know exactly where they're at. So keeping track of your cows, um, you know, from a like forage um, usage standpoint, you can pay attention to where the cows are utilizing, um, whether they need to move. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, lot of, you know, positives on both sides of the coin for, for this one. So let's transition from the producer to the environment, which is obviously kind of a big term um, umbrella there. Um, how does this virtual fencing, how does this benefit the environment of North Central Washington? I'll jump in on that one, Glenn. Um, so I think, I think it's really important um, to convey that Columbia Basin Wildlife Area is it's pretty unique in that it sits right in the middle of the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project, and that irrigation project has resulted in a lot of a lot of wetland habitat out here on this landscape. That wetland habitat is it, it does not have a natural hydrology because it's it's irrigation influenced, and so because of that, you have wetlands that don't have widely fluctuating water levels and therefore they become rimmed with with what we call tall emergent vegetation which is like cattails or bulrush or in in the worst case it would be the invasive an invasive species that we we call phragmites or common reed um, those habitats really uh, threaten the quality of those of those wetlands when those plants come in and invade they dominate um, particularly in these conditions. And the, what grazing does is it allows us to create disturbances around those shoreline edges and create openings and areas for waterfowl to come out and loaf and roost. And that so that greatly um, allows us to, to get more, uh, you know, waterfowl habitat value out of that, as well as the recreational hunting opportunities out of it. So I just wanted to really convey that, that this, 
this technology, it, it seems to be really suited to this particular situation because I think we're limited right now in our ability to use this tool by, by our lack of fencing. So we want to get a lot of impact around these wetland edges, which is which is pretty unique. You know, you don't hear that elsewhere. Um, but for us, in order to do that responsibly and sustainably, we need to have this tool to keep the cows where we want them. We don't want to impact the upland habitats that are that are more of a, a natural uh, shrub step environment. So uh, we want to protect the bitter brush and the sagebrush where we have it in the in the various native perennial bunch grasses so um so that's why we're excited by this tool it, it could it could open up opportunities to graze areas that we we would like to graze but we've we just don't have the infrastructure to do it right so we're definitely sort of the other side of the coin of we're, we're trying to have um impacts with grazing we're, we're trying to to eat some of that vegetation down and, and utilize it both from the producer standpoint but then you know that impacts the habitat quality um, we spend a lot of effort mowing uh, spraying etc in other places money effort time etc like this saves us money in managing wetlands uh, through this way so um, the ability to potentially expand this or to to improve upon uh, our techniques is, is pretty exciting because it's uh, just another tool that, that we're using to to try to set the succession back on these wetlands. I did want to just add one one other little piece to that is so when that when that tall emergent vegetation is removed, it does it gives an opportunity for uh, the short what we call the short emergent vegetation or the annuals. They're the seed producing plants that are providing food for waterfowl. Um, I had not mentioned that I was really focused on the the, the loafing uh, values, but it, it also is a, a large benefit to food production too, or can be um, depending on what what comes in following the tall emergence, but it's typically uh, going to be uh, a seed producing annual. And your guys' assessment, is there potential to expand this to areas across Washington, areas that are maybe not using virtual fencing or perhaps just include more acreage of North Central Washington, or is it kind of covering everything it can cover for right now? I think other other areas are are, like virtual fencing is growing, I think statewide, particularly in Eastern Washington, I believe. Um, so no, it's it, it it will be an emerging technology elsewhere. Um, I think the benefits to Columbia Basin, though, and those wetland habitats um, for waterfowl are, are very different and unique. So I see the way we're applying it being being pretty unique to this area, but. Um, you you know talk about more like the the shrub step habitats where maybe you have you have riparian areas that you're trying to protect because they're salmon bearing streams you can do the same thing you know we can exclude cows from those those salmon bearing streams or protect these riparian areas maybe protect um, areas that are expected to be important for sharp tail grouse nesting for example or lecking or or there's all these different ways we can now carve out. Um, pieces of the landscape to protect. And so uh, I certainly can see this tool being applied uh, more broadly. So do you see this impacting, maybe helping, benefiting producers when it comes to making sure they're in compliance with their grazing permits and any other requirements that they might have? Yeah, so I mean, we got wildlife area management plans. Uh, we got overarching policy that, that runs all the way down to at the base level we have you know a grazing permit that includes basically the prescription for how we're going to graze a particular pasture or particular allotment and so um, as rich described uh, here in the columbia basin ours look a lot different than a, a standard grazing allotment that would be more towards protection of of you know fragile habitats and talk about forage utilization in a in a converse way than we talk about it, we're looking to um, utilize that tall emergent vegetation. So we're looking to to make sure that we're harvesting enough of that by, by utilizing cattle without impacting the uplands. And that's where the vents comes in, the fencing system comes in. It really helps us um, protect those uplands while harvesting those. So we monitor our grazing leases a couple times a year 
looking at um, impacts for utilization, um, making sure that we're not, you know, getting too much on, on, we have a couple pastures that we rotate. So that rotation is based on how much we're utilizing in pasture A and then we move to B, C, D, et cetera. So, um, you know, we can use this uh, because we have a real-time view of where the cows are. It helps us inform like where the cows are are at, how much time they're spending in certain locations. If there's a location that there's a bunch of cows congregated in for a reason, you know, that we don't know a reason, we can go check it out, see, see what is attracting them there. Um, eventually, you know, we, we have the ability to, like, like Rich said, box that out. So if it's something that's gotten too much utilization, um, we could do that. Again, our grazing leases don't hit those thresholds. Uh, too frequently because we are really looking to utilize that tall emergent vegetation versus um, something, you know, like a, a native grassland where we're really looking to, to have a lighter touch. So we aren't really utilizing that portion of the technology frequently, but the ability to see where the cows are, what they're using, um, how, you know, if the, if the entire herd's up in the northwest corner of a pasture and we can pull up the, the app and look at that, that's going to give us a reason to go take a look at that and say, what, you know, what is it? Is this, is this good? Is this bad? Or is this something we need to move them out of here for? So um, it just, you know, it provides more insight into what the cattle are doing on the landscape. Um, the current, you know, policy is, is monitoring um, but that's sort of a static thing. You know, you go out there, you take a look, you take some measurements on vegetation and you have this like static look at what happened. Um, where, you know, with the events, we can look at a real time uh, situation, know where the cows are, where they've congregated and, and what they're doing. I do think it too, it's just, just one more quick thing to point out is that, uh, you know, this technology is not perfect. Um, and we, we kind of, we're talking about it as though it is, and you can just, you know, close an area off to cows. It, it doesn't work that way. It's something that, you know, it's, it's a learned, um, it's, it's the cows got to learn the system and, uh, our cows are still learning it. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not perfect, but I think over time, the technology improves and our ability to train these cows improves and, and we get better over time. But I wouldn't want to give the impression that this is, we can just turn a flick a switch and then cows are no longer going to impact this little patch that we want to protect. It's, it's, that would be untrue, but, but we can certainly do much, much better than we've done in the past. Once again, that was Chad Edison and Rich Finger with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife.